How many know it is a day to share your faith? Now, this is going to be the third time this week that I've mentioned this. Different venues, but I shared this after second service, if you were in the second service Sunday. I shared it with our men uh, Tuesday morning, and then I also shared, I forgot, on Sunday afternoon with our with our at our uh, new members class called Victory Pathway. But I, it was on my heart so strong that I want to share this in the, in the context of everybody hearing it both online and in here. It is time to share our faith and not shut our mouth. Uh, I don't know if you realize, listen, here's the, and I think these stats are low. I think it's actually more than this now. 53% of our community will not go to church. At least, I think it's higher than that now since we've gone through COVID and such. 53% will not go to church. They're not followers of Jesus. And let's get real. We right now live in a post-Christian culture. We used to call, you know, um, America a Christian nation. And I understand the ideology here of the Judeo-Christian ethic, which is still here in a large number of our people. But the trajectory now is post-Christian. That means after Christianity had its effect. Now other things are affecting us, really seeking to drive the populace of America away from the Lord. This is where we live, guys. This is our, this, this is our mission field. Yes or no? So let me say this, uh, over the last number of years, uh, my, several decades now, the church in America has lost its evangelistic thrust. And it is time for us to pick the mantle of evangelism back up and and take to heart what is on God's heart, right? So uh, I've got this in my notes. For some, church has become a place to go and, and listen with no commitment to do anything instead of a place to receive so I can grow and become a part of winning my world to Jesus. The whole goal that, you know, this is like a filling station. The whole reason we have church services is so we can be built up in God as believers. Yes, I give altar calls on Sundays, but you know, we ought to get most people saved outside the walls of this building. Yes or no? And we should get them saved in here. If people aren't coming to the Lord here, it's because we're not bringing them here. And they're not just going to meander. You know, you'll have one or two meander in, but you know, they've got to be invited by you. Yes or no? And people aren't just suddenly going to come to the Lord. I mean, uh, no fisherman that's worth anything is going to go through a full hook in the water without something on it that the fish want to bite. And what if the fisherman just sat on the shore and didn't even throw a hook in the water? He's here, fishy, fishy, fishy. Well, you think he's a fool, you know? But that's what we're doing. We're expecting people to come to the Lord. What am I doing to make that, to push that forward? That should be a main part of my life. So you may have a full-time occupation, getting a little bit ahead of myself here. But here's, here's a full-time task that all of us have, and that is to let our light shine for Jesus and always be ready to share the gospel. Yes or no? It is an ambition we should have. So I want to move all of us to a new era beginning again today in a fresh way. Let's go after the 53% that won't go to church. What do you say? Huh? You with me? So here's a question. Um, what is God's greatest desire? What does he long for more than anything else? Listen to these passages. Very familiar. John 3, 16, 17, New Living. Uh, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. And then if you, if you parallel that with, with the parable of the lost sheep that Jesus mentioned in Matthew 18, 12 through 14, listen, here's New Living Translation. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hill and go out to search for the one that is lost? Or maybe you got, maybe you got six or seven kids. If one of your kids and you're out, you know, maybe you went to Disney World or went to a big fair somewhere and, and you got all your kids with you. If one got lost, what would you do? You going after that kid, right? Now, most of us don't have sheep, but in Jesus' day, they did. So he won't, won't you leave the 99 on the hill and go search for the one that was lost? And after he finds it, I'll tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. Wow. 
Now, now, you know, uh, let me just tell you what's been in my heart recently. Listen, they got, we got some really hellacious things coming. If you read the book of Revelation and understand what, what the seven years prior to Jesus coming is going to bring, it's the breaking of those seals in Revelation 6. It's the blowing of the seven trumpets in Revelation 8, 9. And then there are bold judgments in Revelation 16 that are mentioned. And these things are sequential and they're really hell on wheels for planet earth. And it's God judging his enemies. And it's really, really a precarious time. Over half the population of the world is going to die in the years to come. Now that's a chat. I don't know about you, but that's sobering. We don't like to think that way as Americans because we got our nice house. We got our nice stuff. But, uh, you know, there was a rude awakening in Turkey this week, was there not? And Lord, we just pray and ask for the mercy of God on all of the thousands and thousands of people and thousands even of families that have been affected by this horrendous earthquake. Let your mercy be on them. And Lord, let believers in that area, Lord, let them, oh Lord, let their light shine and give them opportunities and a pathway into people's hearts, we pray. Let your mercy, let your mercy come in in Jesus' name. So that kind of stuff is going to become more frequent. And just think about the people that you work with, people on the street where you live, your, your friends, personal friends, family friends, and then family members. If they don't know Jesus, they're going to go to hell. And, and we don't even think about that. 88%, I've said this so many times, that the stat is 88% of the population of America do not believe that God will allow them to go to hell. 88%. Do you realize the shock that so many people are going to have once they die and they wake up in flames? And whose responsibility is it to tell the story? It's us. So if there's someone that we know and we have influence with them, then we should be praying for those people and asking the Lord for opportunities to share Jesus with them. Should we not? And if we don't, will we, will be, will we be held responsible? I don't have time to go over it, but go, uh, is it Jeremiah, uh, what is it? Jeremiah 318? You remember? Sean? Ezekiel, thank you. Ezekiel 3.18. I said, Jeremiah, it's Ezekiel. You know, if you don't warn the wicked, he'll hold, he'll put the, he'll hold the, you accountable for the blood of the wicked on your hands. And boy, it's a really sobering thing to read. It's not in my notes. Luke 15, listen to this. This is so good. This is New Living Te- uh, Translation. Tax collectors, other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus. Now, this made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told him this story. If a man has a hundred sheep, one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the ninety-nine others in the wilderness and go search for one that is lost till he finds it? And when he's found it, will he joyfully, uh, he will joyfully carry it on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. The same way there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. He loves everybody just the same, but that one person, he's looking. Can you imagine that God is right now, he's looking for people to come to him. In fact, God's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. And uh, James 5, 7 says, the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. It's a, it's a, a euphemism. God is the farmer. And he's wanting to reap the harvest of the lost souls of people before Jesus comes back. I got this uh, quote from John Maxwell a number of years ago. It was at a, it was at a meeting where he was one of the keynote speakers and uh, he was teaching on leadership, but he said this and it really moved me. And uh, he said, God loves people I don't know. Then he said, God loves people I don't like. How many people that you work with, you say, I just don't like that person. Well, God loves them. How about them people on, on, live on your street? I just don't even want to see that person. Well, God loves them. Uh, people in your family. Well, I don't want to go to, I'm not going to Thanksgiving eating around the table with that person. God loves them. Yes or no? So questions, am I passionate about what God is passionate about? He's passionate about the lost being saved. That, that is those that are on the way, way to hell if they die coming to know Jesus so they don't perish eternally. What do I need to change to open myself up to befriend people that don't know Jesus? Another last question, do I actively pray and ask for opportunities 
to be a witness for Jesus every day. If I don't include in my prayers every day prayers for the lost, I'm not praying right. Yes or no? Question, who, who in your life, do you have lists of people that you pray for regularly to come to Jesus? I've got a whole, I've got a list of people. They're in my life. They're in my prayer life constantly. I'm expecting the Lord. In fact, I was in my office tonight and a couple of them come to mind. I just prayed for them again because I don't want them to go to hell. I know these people very well. Some of them are family members and I want them to go to heaven. So here's four things we can do. You ready for this? Again, 53% of people won't come to church. We've got to take the message to them. So number one, accept your job description from Jesus to help the unchurched become followers of Jesus. How many will accept that? It's your job description, y'all. In fact, when we get to heaven, you know, Jesus is going to say, what would you do to help? He may ask, this might be one of his questions. What what'd you do to help uh, Help me bring people to me. What would you do? What would you do to help me? Mm. So Matthew 28, 18 through 20, here is our job description. Jesus came and told his disciples, followers, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I'm always with you. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So that's, our, that's called the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. I mean, it is a commission. I'm supposed to be about it. We have become so comfortable in America, and that's the reason our nation is in shambles. Huh? I mean, this wokeness, I mean, it is awful, nasty, treacherous, and demonic. Did you hear me? And, and, and the whole sexualized culture, sexualizing young people, it's 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 it reeks, and my friends, we have to lay all of this pro- these problems at our feet, and uh, things are beginning to come unraveled right now. We got some really challenging times ahead, and I'm asking God for grace and mercy, but we need to be getting ready. And paramount on our hearts should be the salvation of the people that we are around on a regular basis, asking God for them. Second Corinthians 5.18, New Living Translation, uh, 18 through 20. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Let me read it again. And God has given us this task. How about read it out loud with me? And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. What is that task for God was in Christ? Reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And God, and, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. It's a shocking thought. Listen, it's not, it's not sins that cause people to go to hell. It's the rejection of Jesus that causes people to go to hell. Did you hear me? So we decry the wrongness of sin and the awfulness. Yeah, it's true, it's awful. And, and you know, we could summarize and say sin is a lifestyle, of course, yeah, but it's not sin that's, that, that causes people to go to hell. It's the rejection of Jesus. Look at it the other way. The antidote for the sin is Jesus. He's already done everything necessary to save your hide and to keep you out of the flame. And every single person that you see is that way too. He's, he's made available a way for them to escape the flames of hell. And, and, but they've got to know about it. How can they, how the, can they call on him of whom they have not heard? Romans 10 said, yes or no? Um, you know, I was in church 18 years and this guy with a great big old cross, his name was Steve, come to see me at my workplace. I don't know why he came down my aisle. I, I don't even know why. But he came down my aisle, and uh, I'm, he, he became a really good friend of mine. And um, uh, anyway, he, uh, he started talking to me. I worked in a grocery store. I was 17 years of age. And he would come down my aisle and tell me about Jesus. And uh, I would just look at him, and he said, You need Jesus, my friend. I don't know you, but you need you. And he invited me to his church. I ended up going to his church, and the rest is history. I mean, my life was transformed just because this guy took the time to speak to me. But one of the things he said to me that just piqued my interest, and I've been in church 18 years, did you know not God's not mad at you because of your sin? I said, well, well no. 
No, because, you know, I'd heard God's angry with the wicked every day. I said, God, and here's what he said. God took your sin, placed it on his son. So he's not, he, he wants you to come to his son and his son will get rid of your sin. But when he said God's not mad at you because of your sin, he wants to come to your, you to come to his son. I listened to it because I thought, well, God was angry with me all the time. I thought he just couldn't stand me when I found out there was an ability to come to God because of what Jesus did. And because that God just took some time, it just it, it opened up my whole world. So how many are willing to accept the job description from Jesus to go share Jesus with others? So we'll go a step further here. Number two, the four points here, become friends with people God loves. Everybody say it. Become friends with people God loves. Remember, God loves people you don't know and people you don't like, okay? So so here's, you know, I had this happen. I had known the Lord very, just a few days because I was working in a public place going to school. And I just, this thing impacted me. I can still remember where I was on a grocery aisle. I was in charge of the meat aisle, all of the canned meats. And they're very meticulous. And a lot of them are really small in that whole aisle. And I had to order it, maintain it and all that. You know, a little 16, 17-year-old guy. And uh, But here, so I was working away on my little aisle, you know. And it's busy and people are buying groceries like crazy. And, and I just never forget, I looked up from my box. And here comes a person. And for the first ten month time in my life, I don't even, I, see, I'm at a loss of words when I, I put my eyes on them. I felt towards them the way God does. He loves them. See, I didn't know that person. But the first, first time I thought, you know, God loves that person. They're going to spend eternity somewhere. I wonder where it is. I never had those kind of thoughts in my whole life. But after I came to Jesus and then was baptized with the Holy Spirit, started having those thoughts all the time. And boy, it just moved me just to share it, it, to share what happened to me with others. How many hear me? So become friends with people God loves. Listen to 1 Corinthians nine nineteen. Everybody okay? Even though I am free, this is the message paraphrase, awesome. Even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, Paul says, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists. You ever met any of those? Loose living immoralists. You ever met any of those? The defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. Now, that's important. I did, how about, say it out loud. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. That is so good. Go get my notes and download them and, and look at that. Maybe you look at it. Every, isn't that good? Ah, oh, let me read it again. I'm, though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists. That's the person that's got the list. Want to make sure you've done everything just right. Loose living immoralists, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is gosh, in an attempt to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. Y'all, I mean, y'all, that, I, I, that, does that grab you? You know, when I first came to Jesus, again, I was 17, and uh, I had worked at the gro this grocery store since I was 16. In fact, I had hair down to my shoulders. I had to get my ears white-walled. You know what that is? Uh, to be able to work at that grocery store, and I did it. And I was in school. I'd, I graduated from high school when I was 16, went right into college, and so I was young. And so, uh, but I was, and these guys knew me, and we were responsible for stocking the groceries in the store, yada, yada. And uh, anyway, simple job, sure. But um, these guys get to know me. And I mean, you know, we curse a blue streak. I smoked and did and cursed and lust and did everything they did at work, you know. And, uh, and they saw me, but, but over a weekend, I changed. My lifestyle changed. I changed. 
they picked on, these guys picked on me mercilessly. They would try to find me in just one little foible, one little error, one little mistake. In fact, one time I, I've heard you, you've heard me say, I dropped a big old can of beans on my big toe and I let out, <laughs> just like I used to, I cursed. And it hurt my heart so bad. So, oh God, why did I ever, why did I say that? I didn't mean to say it and I repented. First thing I did is look around. Because if they had heard me do that, they would have lambasted me. They would have tore me up. They were always looking for something. They were always asking me, you sin today, Mitch? You want a cigarette, Mitch? Have you lusted today, Mitch? They're just rascals, just rascals. And uh, anyway, just always picking on me. But I left that place in 1980. Uh, Susan, I, I actually, during that time, I changed colleges, went to a Bible school, and then Susan and I moved to Oklahoma to go to another Bible school. They got married. They saw me get married and all that. All these little guys did. But you know, the week I left, the week I left to do, go to Oklahoma, listen, these guys did not know God. I'm talking there's six, seven, eight of them. Listen, listen, I, I can't tell you how it impacted my life. Every one of them. I'm working. It's my last week. And they would make sure, in fact, I saw them when they turned the corner to the aisle I was working on, or either I'm in the back room where my, where my uh, supplies are, and they would do like this to make sure nobody's looking, and they'd come over and say, Mitch, uh, we're going to miss you. I mean, all of them say about the same thing. We, we're going to miss you here. Um, we saw you change. Here's what they say. We saw you change. And uh, I know we picked on you a lot. All of them say, I, I know we picked on you a lot. I just want you to know. You give me hope that if you can change, I can change. And I hope you do well with your schooling. That's what they, and did you know they took up money to send me to Bible school? Yeah, and they didn't know the Lord. They did not know the Lord. You understand that the influence you have with people if you'll just be their friend. And they'll antagonize you, criticize you, make fun of you. And now it's worse than ever, right? If you're going to stand up for Jesus and really be a believer. But I'm telling you, you know, and, and many of these guys, years later, uh, I, I would find them. I, didn't, I haven't been in my hometown a lot, but uh, the ones I was able to make contact with, many of them met the Lord in, in, uh, later on in their life. And, and part of that was, thank God, the influence that I had. I have so many stories like that to tell. Friends, be open and share Jesus with others. They are looking for you to be real. You don't have to speak uh, King James English. You just want to be a friend to them. Uh, September 12th is my spiritual birthday, and in 1980, I had the wonderful privilege of, uh, after we, Susan and I moved to Tulsa, I was in Bible school, of leading one of the guys that I, I was actually the night manager in a grocery store, and uh, we were responsible for making sure the store was ready every day for work for, for the uh, clientele to come in. It was closed at night. And, uh, it, but I got to know these guys, and, and most of them smoked pot, drank. And, you know, I, I don't know where they got the term, but they would go to bars and they called them boogie bars. Y'all ever heard of that? I figure it's from the boogie woogie, boogie woogie, boogie woogie dancing. I don't know, but they called it. I don't know where they got the boogie bars. Well, I'm going to the boogie bar today. So I hope you have fun at the boogie bar, you know, but they, they would just talk to me. And when they found, I never told them I was in Bible school, but when I told them that when, when they just talked to me about my life and and I was able to express to them what Jesus did for me and how I smoked pot and how I was a mess and how Jesus changed my life. They were really interested. And uh, one guy, his, his name's David, um, uh, over the years he sent me cards for Christmas and this kind of thing. But uh, uh, on my spiritual birthday at the bailing machine where we throw the cardboard in, he came up to me one night after just, he would talk to me. We're working on the aisles in the grocery store throughout the wee hours of the morning. And, uh, you know, he'd ask me questions, and I'd just answer his questions about the Lord. He had all kinds of crazy questions, but really none are crazy. They're just questions. And they come up to me just before we got off, and I was at the bailing machine just getting ready to go, throwing my cardboard in it because they bail it up to recycle. And uh, he said, Mitch, uh, would you pray with me? I said, for what? He said, I want to give my life to Jesus. And you know what I said? Would you say that again? He <laughs> said, I want to give my, what? I said, well, well, yeah. And I prayed him right through to salvation right at the bailing machine. Isn't that awesome? So, you know, people are hungry, and I think they're hungry now more than ever. Did you hear what I'm saying? So number three, ask God for opportunities to be involved in someone's salvation every single day. Now, I shared this in the membership class, our Victory Pathway. I shared it second service at the end Sunday morning. I also shared it with the men Tuesday morning. 
Now here's 1 Corinthians 3, 6 uh, through 8, New Living Translation. Here's, 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 what, here's how to make this practical. Here's what Paul said. I planted the seed in your hearts. Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What, what's important is that God makes the seed grow. Isn't that good? The one who plants and the one who waters works together with the same purpose. Both will be rewarded for their own hard work. So, 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 so here's the way I look at it. And if you'll see it this way, it can keep you stirred up to evangelize. It's not necessary, you know, if you got it in head, everybody I'll talk to, I got to lead them to salvation right now. No, no, no. You are a farmer. You're a seed planter every day. And you're planting seeds in people's lives. You may have a one-sentence conversation with somebody, or it may be a paragraph, or you may be in passing, or somebody that you know. It's the context of the relationship. But as God gives you opportunities, plant seeds, sow seeds. You're planting when you share with somebody, and immediately they're turned off about Jesus. They don't want to hear it. They turn their head. They walk away. If they're work, if they're on break at work, they won't even talk to you. I've had people just not. Just, I mean, I've had people do this. Oh, I said, well, God bless you, you know. I've just, but, but because they didn't want to hear it was an affront to their lifestyle. I've had people say, well, I'm an atheist or I'm an agnostic. There are no atheists. There are, yeah, come on. That, that's an excuse. Anyway, but I've had people, but, but see, if, if they don't receive it, you're planting a seed. And here's the issue. It takes, and the, those that are in the know say, st- statisticians say it takes seven gospel contacts before a person even becomes interested in salvation. Isn't that interesting? At least seven contacts with people, uh, different people, before they even get interested. Now think about the people that come to the Lord. People that come and walk the aisles in our services, they've, they've probably had a number of gospel contacts in their life. That's the reason that they're here, Right? So when you're out and about with people, understand if somebody just doesn't want to receive anything about the Lord, you make a statement and they immediately change the conversation. It's okay. You planted a seed. You're one of those seven people. You get my, for some people, it might take 15. I don't know. You get what I'm saying? But see, that's your responsibility. It's your job assignment, right? How many understand? The second thing, you know, you water. Watering is when you share with somebody and I've had this happen often when I'm at a restaurant. I'm often at restaurants because I take people out to eat, and we talk about this and that and the other, um, et cetera. And, uh, so, but I'll carry on the conversation with a waitress or waitor, and um, if, if, I, if I mention something to them and they immediately change the conversation, I know I'm planting. But many is the times it's been, oh, yeah, you know, I used to go to church and blah, blah. If I say something about the Lord, some nuance of spiritual content. And they cabbage onto it and, and let and talk for a few minutes. That tells me I'm watering. Well, just let it happen. You may not pray with them right then, but but you know, pray for them afterwards. You're part of the process of them coming to Jesus, right? And then invariably, they're going to be people who are ripe. They're ready, and uh, and they want you to pray with them, just like the guy at the bailing machine with me. Uh, you know, that was I don't know how many times I talked to him, and I'm sure others did as well. So again. Um, don't, let me also say this. Don't wait till your life is totally right. You don't have to be perfect to share Jesus with others. I mean, people may see your flaws, your misgivings, your misdeeds, your wrong words, your wrong actions, your aggravating, your, your rascal attitude, and you may let that be seen at work. But you know what? If you take somebody out to lunch or on a break, I mean, when you're working, you ought to give it 100%. Right? But you're on break or whatever, and they may have a no solicitation policy where you work. I get all that kind of stuff. But when you're on your own and you're around people that you work, you know, talk to them about, you know, ask the Lord to open up the conversation. You'll be amazed at how he will do that. How many hear me? It's really important. I got a lot to say, but I got to move on here. Uh, but again, don't wait until your life is totally right before you allow God to use you. You may be struggling in some area of life. That doesn't mean that God can't use you to minister to someone else. Yes or no? Don't forget, I say it all the time, Job 42.10, the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. And so God will minister to you. As you minister to others, God will in turn minister to you. When I started ministry, I was so imperfect. I had so many flaws. I was talking to others. It's like I'm pointing my finger at them. And look, I got four looking at me. (laughs) It's like, wow, 
It's, they need to be praying for me. That's the way it is, y'all. Don't wait till you're perfect for God to use you or else he could use none of us because none of us are perfect, right? Number four and lastly, prepare yourself to share Jesus with people. And this is very practical, 1 Peter 3.15. The message paraphrase, be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks you why you're living the way you are and always, always with the utmost courtesy. Uh, English Standard Version uh, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. That means we carry a reverence for Jesus inside of us, and we love Him. Then he says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And he's just saying, always be ready to share to share who you are and what Jesus did for you. So um, 1 John 1, 3, New Living Translation, we proclaim to you, what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father, with His Son, Jesus Christ. I shared this in the class, and I think I shared it with the men Tuesday morning, um, 1977 Bible school class. This thing really, really impacted my life when the professor said, you're going to come back next week. He gave us three by five index cards. He said, I want you to make one paragraph on what Jesus has done in your life and make it concise to the point. And we're going to get up and you're going to share it with the whole class. We had about, I don't know, 30, 40 people in the class and it took a few times and we got through them and it was awesome. But you know, it, it made me, forced me to think about what did Jesus set me free from? See, if you'll share those things, that's what comes out of you with passion. And that's what John said, that which we have seen, that which we have heard. <laughs> Uh, we share with you. And that's what comes out again with passion. So I encourage you, maybe go to the notes section on your phone. Uh, since we do everything digital, there's my wife. Hey, Susan. I'm sorry. She's in Alabama right now. I miss you, love. Um, on the notes section, of your, and just type out a paragraph of what Jesus has done. Maybe you type it out, so that doesn't sound right. And maybe you make some corrections. We'll do it, but have it ready. And then think about it, rehearse it, uh, read it to yourself until you kind of know it. And then as things progress and you're, you're planting, you're watering, and then somebody else wants to know more, then you can just share what Jesus did for you. Bruce McDonald is a missionary that... Um, Really, as an apostle, he uh, he was in the Soviet Union, lived there for 10 years in Moscow. And then uh, he's planted over 800 churches in Russia. Uh, once the Berlin Wall fell and we were able to go into Russia, he went and lived there for 10 years. Then he's been all over Africa. And I've been to India, Africa, and Siberia with Bruce McDonald. So Bruce, that, I'm just saying that we had so many conversations traveling all these crazy places we've gone to and um, in the airports or whatever, just waiting on the plane. And he shared so many things about his life with me. But one thing I never forgot, he said, you know, he was a very, very wealthy businessman. And he gave up a, a very, very, very lucrative job to go on the mission field and become a missionary. And uh, he was, and, and he told me, he said, I was a Catholic before I came to Jesus. And he said, um, he said, you know, I got a revelation one day that I was going to go to hell and I was unsaved. And his voice broke when he told me, he said, you know, I, um, I saw it and I knew I would go. If I was to die, I would go to hell. And he said, I came to Jesus. But then he said, I took a class. He said, the church I attended, I took a class on evangelism. And they had just three simple points. And he said, I've always used that. And as we traveled, I mean, we've been literally just all kinds of places in India We've been mainly Ethiopia and um, and other you know a couple other uh, nations in um, in Africa, um, but everywhere we were, he's constantly talking to people. Um, uh, he had a degree in sociology, so he understood culture as well, and he really enjoyed talking to people. But he said, "Here's what I live by," and I never forgot what he said one day. We were sitting waiting on an, a plane, and he said. Uh, here are three principles I live by. Make a friend, be a friend, and then share Jesus when the opportunity comes. And I really, it's just so simple. Make a friend, be a friend, and then share Jesus when the opportunity opens. Everybody say, make a friend, be a friend, share Jesus when the opportunity opens. Is that good? 
So I just want to encourage you. We have, uh, let me just say this, uh, if you got one. Uh, we have these cards on the plexiglass stand in the foyer. Those are there for a reason. I haven't mentioned them in a long, long time. Go pick these cards up. It's, all, it's just Victory Church. It's got our website. It's got our phone number. It's got our address. And, um, and yeah, um, I encourage you, pass these out and invite people to church with you. You know, that's, that's one part of this. The other part is just sharing your story, planting, watering, you get it. But the other part is really put something in somebody's hands. Hey, if you're leaving a tip and leave a good one or don't put this down. <laughs> if you're giving a tip, put one of the cards on the table. Does that make sense? I mean, just, you know, because cause it'll open up conversation. And, uh, you know, I, God just gave me something. I'm sitting over there during praise and worship. You know what I'm going to start doing? I take a two. I walked almost three miles today, pray this afternoon. I'm, I'm going to take these on my prayer walk and I'm just kind of, <laughs> oh, what is that? Cause, you know, I'm going to do it. Because <laughs> I walk as two miles all the way around my neighborhood and I'm just going to chunk it, you know, it's like, okay. Because <laughs> somebody's going to pick that thing up, right? <laughs> huh? You say, that's littering. Well, I think that's good littering. Because somebody's, somebody's going to pick that up. Somebody's dog's going to sniff it and they say, what is that? Right? And then if they go to the website, there's a whole chunk of information there, right? So let's pray. Y'all ready? So how many, will, how many are willing to bite it? How many are willing to go after it? If you're willing, raise your hand. So Father God, we come right now in the name of Jesus. Keep your hand raised up. Say it out loud. Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me for any time in my life as a believer that I have lost my evangelistic zeal. I repent before the throne of God and ask you to forgive me for any hardness of heart or any callousnesses that I've had or any inconsiderateness that I've had towards others that are on their road to hell. I ask you, sensitize my heart to the people around me. And Lord, count me in. I accept I accept the mandate. I accept the job description to go into my world and preach the gospel to every creature with my life and with my words. Planting, watering, and you giving the increase. I give you permission. Speak through me as you speak to me and make me a blessing to people. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, we just give thanks.